Traditional clinker construction was the main method of building vessels under around six or seven metres, 18 to 21 feet or so, in countries with European traditions until the arrival of fibreglass reinforced plastic in the second half of the 20th century. But of course, we can still build them today. In the first two episodes, we lofted a small dinghy, so we have the true shapes of the moulds around which we'll bend the planking and the shapes of the transom and the bow and stern knees. If you started with a set of plans with full-size patterns, this is where you come in, as you didn't have to loft. Your patterns are simply the tracings of someone else's lofting. But first, let's start making a bit of the boat. Most boats will have at least one transom or tuck. One of the dinghies we'll be building has two, being a pram or snub. Perhaps you have a single piece of timber wide enough to make the transom, but chances are you will need to build it up from two or three planks. Arrange your pieces for a pleasing grain effect if you will be clear finishing, and make sure the grain alternates as seen in section. This helps limit any future warping. Joint the mating edges with the longest plane you've got for a dead square, light tight fit. Use long overlapping strokes and constantly check your progress. When you're happy that the parts fit well together, cut a groove in each mating edge with a table saw, router or tonguing plane. Cut plywood splines and check for a sliding fit. Then glue together, clamping with long clamps or with wedges as seen here. While the glue dries, you can start to pick up the shapes that you need from the lofting. There's more than one way to get the shapes transferred from the lofting to the timber. The traditional method is to tap flat-headed nails into the lines you wish to transfer, the outline of the mould or knee you're picking up, plus all of the grid lines that cross it. And press your mould timber down so that the nail heads leave impressions that you can join up with ink or pencil. Tack this timber to another piece and cut them out together so you have both sides of the mould. And don't forget to transfer the grid lines onto the second piece. Assemble the moulds on the loft floor. Use the grid lines to lay them in the correct position. Join them with plywood or timber cleats and fit a cross ball with one edge exactly on a waterline chosen so that the cross balls can all be at the same waterline on all moulds. A more modern method, especially if you're using sheet material like plywood, chipboard or MDF for your mould stock, is to tack or tape mylar film on the lofting and trace the shapes and grid lines. Then tack the tracing over the mould stock and prick through the relevant lines. Use exactly the same technique when using paper patterns. Join up the dots and cut close to the line. You don't have to be too close to the line, but any extra has to be planed off. But make sure you can still see the pencil line all the way around. Don't plane it yet. Put these moulds aside for the moment. If you don't have paper patterns or tracings, you need to make patterns out of timber or plywood for some of the timber parts that you have to cut out, like the stem and the stern knees and the transom and the sketch using the flathead nail impressions method. We used this method directly on the stock for the skeg of our dinghy, and you could also do this with knees, but a pattern is better in most cases. Knees are best selected from stock with curved grain, usually found where a branch leaves the tree, or for larger knees where the buttress roots join the trunk. On the east coast of Australia, we traditionally use tea tree, a melaleuca species. Plane them down to the required thickness and place your tracing or paper or solid pattern for best effect on the stock and cut them to shape. You can also laminate knees. Cut your laminates so that each piece bends easily around the required curve and the whole group together requires a bit of pressure. Mix epoxy glue to a just brushable consistency and apply to both mating surfaces. Bend around a jig using plenty of clamps. Make sure you have sheet plastic under so as it doesn't become part of the bench. Here I'm laminating a frame for another boat, but the same principles apply. After the glue has dried, clean up both sides with power and hand planes and mark out the exact shape from your patterns or tracings. The transom knee has one leg planed dead square and straight to fit against the transom 
and the other leg also dead square but planed to a very slight curve to fit the keel batten. When you mark out the stem knee, don't forget to mark the rabbit line and the back rabbit line as well as any water lines that cross it on both sides. On larger stems there may be an apron on the inside to provide enough landing for the planking. On our small stem dinghy we have the apron as part of the stem so we need to route down to the thickness of the outer stem. It's a lot easier to cut the planking rabbit in the stem on the bench than it is after setting it up. Chisel it out, but only to about 75-80% of its depth. Final finishing must wait until you have a plank ready to fit. At this stage you can also sand and perform any other finishing tasks such as rounding edges on knees or tapering the skeg. You have to clean up the glue dags and flatten your laminated transoms before marking the shapes out. A grinder or belt sander is quick, but I recommend you don't use either of these as they will nearly always leave divots in the surface that are difficult to remove. It's best to remove most excess glue before it cures. Plane both surfaces flat and true with mostly diagonal strokes. If there is a slight warp, that's okay, but make the convex side the outside of the transom. Sand both sides with a medium grit, then prick through your paper patterns or tracing, or mark out with your solid pattern. If the transom pattern represents the outside of the transom, you must leave plenty of wood outside the line when cutting. The angle at which the planking lands on the transom means that the inside of the transom is well bigger than the outside. The extra wood is referred to as bevelling wood. Leave excess wood on top as well. Make sure you have some nail impressions marking the centre line and any water lines in the excess wood area. With most boats, it's best to join the stern knee to the transom before setting up. Same for bow transoms in a pram dinghy. Lightly pencil the centre line and measure and mark a few position marks on the inside of the transom. If you don't have the manpower we had here to hold the parts together, you'll need to get inventive with clamps and blocks of wood. Drill the holes through the knee first, then locate it exactly in position, remembering to allow room for the keel button, and continue the drilled holes right through the transom. The holes should be drilled with a bit just larger than the square shank size of the nail, but smaller than the diagonal distance across the corners. Test a nail in a hole in an offcut of the knee. It should be a driving fit. If it's too tight, the nail will start to bend, and it's time to pull it out, which might not be easy, and re-drill the hole one size larger. Apply some sort of bedding compound to the mating surfaces. Traditionally gummy old varnish if clear finishing, or white lead paste if painting. These days I generally use a low modulus polyurethane sealant. Tap the nails in from the outside so that the points just protrude. Oh, and don't forget to countersink the hole so the nail heads will end up flush. And join the two parts, then drive the nails home, backing up with a dolly. Drive the correct size rove onto the nail, backing up the nail head, then nip the protruding nail off close to the rove. In most cases, you simply rest the jaws of the nippers on the rove. Then, still backing up the nail head, use a light ball-peen hammer to rivet the nails so that it spreads out over the rove. Aim to hit with the hammer ball dead centre on the nail. This forces it to spread out. A nail this size should take around 30 to 40 rapid hits. Finish with some tapping around the edge to flatten out any sharp bits. The hammer used should be the lightest that will do the job. A too heavy hammer is likely to bend the nail inside the timber. In part two of this story, episode four, we'll decide how we're going to set up our two dinghies.